Didn't finish my breakfast. Fed the dogs, though. I'm not allowed to leave home without feeding the dogs. That's no good. Nope. Nope. It's also a name of a Princeton professor that I wanted to remember and I can't remember his name. Sorry about that. If I think of it, I'll I'll mention it. So if you looked at the article, for the good of the people, where I put underlines, if I can see them without glasses, And this puts men out of a state of nature into that of a commonwealth. So same same approach, because he's obviously read Hobbes, and he's convinced that Hobbes is right about most of the argument, including his psychology, things of that sort. We we get a little bit more additional uh, uh, progress uh, between Hobbes and Locke, obviously. Um, But by the time uh, um, uh, uh, we get to Locke, there's been no real progress with regard to uh, the the shape uh, uh, that a good government uh, should take. Um, I mean, we could go back to Aristotle. Aristotle argues there are three basic types of governments. Maybe I should, should look for that. So basically, logically, uh, there would be um, the rule of one. Here we go. This looks like a good page to look at. Hopefully. But the rule of one. And for each of them, by the way, there will be two types, a good and a bad. Oh, I'm, I, this is a whole presentation. Wonderful. That's not. Let's not do that one. This will be just a page. So you have three types of government, just basic logic. Uh, The first one is when you just have one ruler. Uh, And so the uh, kind that Aristotle argues is the good form of that is a monarchy. And the bad form of that would be what we would call a tyranny. Remember, the only difference really between the two of them is that we've got a good leader and a bad leader. Right? So if you've got a good leader, you've got a monarchy, it's a good government. If you've got a, a tyrant, uh, it's a bad form of government. Uh, who would we consider historically a bad leader? Anybody have any favorites? Mao. Mao? Could argue that Mao is a bad leader. Of course, if you did, you'd probably be killed if you were in China. Yeah, so there's irony there, I suppose. A lot of people would argue Hitler uh, was a bad leader because of the Holocaust. Uh, but I don't know if I mentioned this before. It's politically incorrect. I noticed that's kind of part of my job, to be politically incorrect. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there's a book uh, titled The Taste of War which points out that the reason uh, the committee uh, that advised Hitler uh, said that 20 million people are going to starve to death, roughly, uh, was because Churchill was enforcing a a ban or a a, um, a 
blockade of Europe, uh, right? The, the Nazis are in continental Europe, and Churchill was using the British Navy to keep any supplies from getting to Europe, and Europe was uh, not capable of feeding itself. It had to get its, its food and other supplies from outside uh, of Europe. Uh, and so the committee basically explained to Hitler, well, that, you know, with this blockade, unless we break it and get supplies, 20 million people are going to starve to death. And Hitler prioritized. He said, OK, well, uh, you know, the Germans are not the ones that are going to starve. Uh, so number one, who do we kill, right, uh, so that they're no longer eating? Uh, and of course, you started off with the handicapped, famously aged handicapped, uh, those folks uh, least capable of handling, helping themselves. And then he started with uh, those groups in society that, of course, the Europeans traditionally uh, considered, uh, uh, especially Germans, would consider uh, hateful. Uh, so, of course, the Jews were one, uh, but uh, Slavs in general uh, were, were another target, and so on. Um, so, uh, the point of that is that, well, the reason, perhaps, uh, that the Holocaust occurred was not just because Hitler had a mind to, to have that done, but it was brought on by Churchill's equally vicious uh, decision to starve the people in Europe. Uh, so in other words, it's not just Hitler's fault, uh, who, of course, we would normally consider to be the evil tyrant. Uh, but if you, th you, if you look at it from the Germanic perspective, of course, the evil tyrant was Churchill. And in a sense, both of them were equally uh, 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 horrible. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you're British and or American, depending on what side you took, in America, uh, you would of course say Churchill was a hero, right? You know, you know, et cetera, right? Uh, you get you get the the picture. So so while we might normally just think of Hitler as an, an evil tyrant, butcher, uh, and remember Stalin, we usually, uh, if you're Russian, you think of Stalin as a hero, because he saved the Soviet Union from the Nazi, uh, uh, you know, machine, right? Uh, yet at the same time, how did Stalin do it? He killed 20 million people of his, of his own people, right? you know, to, to starve them. And the, the comparison made uh, often is that, well, uh, uh, Stalin uh, prioritized different, right? Instead of uh, uh, killing uh, certain groups of people uh, because of their ethnic uh, uh, basis, he instead uh, started by saying, we need the army first, uh, so we'll feed the army first, and then in order to supply the army, we need to feed the people who are in the factories making the arms, and then the farmers are the last, uh, and so the, the farmers were the ones that Stalin killed, and that seems absolutely ridiculous since, of course, they're the ones that produce the food, but the kulaks, the, the farmers, were the ones that Stalin uh, prioritize so but so one ruler uh, for Aristotle and this is still we still break it up this way Aristotle has had quite the impact thousands of years on us uh, so one ruler monarchy or tyranny a few rulers so this is the aristocracy aristoi means best uh, and so basically an aristocracy uh, Aristotle thought was the the better of the two, the correct form of government. And an oligarchy or plutocracy, these are all variants of groups, small groups that would run government. So the rule of the rich, the rule of the military, the rule of, say, a theocracy as Iran is uh, today, uh, et cetera. Uh, today we might argue uh, whether or not the United States is a democratic republic or a plutocracy uh, because it's ruled by the rich uh, etc. Right. Um, many rulers would be a direct democracy, and an anarchy is the deviant form of that. Now, the odd thing is uh, when they they refer to it as a democracy, often by just calling it a democracy, that's close to anarchy. And and a um, polity is the word that they will use uh, to say a good 
form of government with many rulers or all uh, the deme or the people. Uh, so, so thanks to Aristotle, we get this basic arrangement. And for Aristotle, by the way, the aristoi, uh, the, uh, the best form of government he thought was an aristocracy. Uh, um, and the main reason for that is the problem with the monarchy is you're right, right on the tipping point if, the, if that monarch switches from being a good ruler to a bad ruler, uh, you're, you're in a hellacious situation, not much you can do, uh, et cetera. So for him, the best is an aristocracy. But Hobbes takes Aristotle's uh, philosophy and argues that the monarchy is the best. Uh, and the reason he does that, remember he, he's a tutor for Charles II, uh, and so uh, um, uh, thought highly of his own 2T, right? Uh, and the, um, the other reason is he was focused on security. And if you have a group of uh, individuals all fighting for power, you're not going to have security. And remember, Hobbes lived through the Civil War, which wasn't completely over by the time Locke comes along. Uh, in fact, Locke uh, had to escape uh, England for his own safety several times himself. Uh, um, and the, the final uh, return uh, comes back with uh, Mary, uh, William's uh, wife, uh, and Queen of England, so William and Mary, King and Queen, the Glorious Revolution. Uh, and the main thing that's different when the British invited, uh, the Parliament invited William and Mary to come, because uh, he was a cousin of James, who they no longer liked, right? So, so it went, correct me if I screw this up, remember I'm just going by memory, Charles I, deposed and head chopped off by Oliver Cromwell, right? And don't forget John Milton was the, the secretary for Oliver Cromwell. John Milton, the famous blind poet uh, that gives us Paradise Lost. But if you look up his collected works, you see it takes a full shelf of heavy tomes, etc. cetera. Uh, because he was the secretary doing all the bureaucracy for, for London's government at the time, right, for Oliver Cromwell. Um, uh, Oliver Cromwell dies, uh, his son Richard Cromwell takes over for about three years uh, and immediately people say, oh the heck with him, let's bring back Charles II. And so Charles II comes in, uh, the trouble is Charles II dies uh, and then his uh, brother James uh, takes over and James they didn't like and so after a while they decided to invite his cousin William uh, from the Netherlands, and William comes uh, and they have what's called the Glorious Revolution because there is no real battle. James virtually capitulates with just the one bot battle in Ireland and basically runs away uh, from that situation. Doesn't, doesn't completely run away, he actually sticks around and ends up being in charge of uh, companies. Uh, so, so there's lots of other intrigue and things going on uh, there. Uh, but so Locke is associated with William and his arguments, uh, and they come even before William comes in, are from the side of the parliament. Uh, keep in mind that John Locke's father was one of Oliver Cromwell's captains in his cavalry. Uh, so they're connected with the Cromwell side, uh, what uh, would also be called Whig philosophy, basically, uh, down with the aristocracy, basically, up with the people. Uh, and by the way, Oliver Cromwell, is, it's pretty interesting, one of the reasons Oliver Cromwell won uh, was because he learned his lesson, you don't use just rabble to fight against trained soldiers, you have to have trained soldiers to fight them, and so he hired uh, thousands of trained soldiers that were called the Roundheads uh, because of their armor. Uh, and they devastated the royal uh, military uh, in several battles. Uh, Nansby was one, the, the first one, an, an important one. Um, uh, and so Locke's father is a Puritan. These are, the, the, those men were all Puritans. 
uh, against the Catholic Char Charles II. Is this boring or is this interesting? It all ties in, uh, I think, uh, especially since uh, uh, being on that side uh, and, and it's absolutely fascinating how Oliver Cromwell wins, but then he has all these hired men that he has to pay and their main reason that they were in, the, in it and on his side was not because they were loyal to him or because they were especially loyal uh, to the Puritan religion or to any particular side. They were in it as mercenaries for the money. And so when the battle was over and they all showed up and st sat in parliament and started to argue for things, uh, they were arguing for themselves for how are we going to get paid, how much are we, et cetera, right? Uh, so, so if you look at the beginnings of parliamentaryism, uh, uh, a lot of it was the mercenaries basically showing up and fighting for what they decided they, they were due and who was going to be in charge, et cetera. Uh, so, so it's kind of interesting uh, how that works. Uh, but so Locke ends up on that side and, and Locke uh, in his uh, analysis of the state of nature and why we form a government is going to come up with a very different legitimating narrative. Uh, it's still basically a social contract, but the reason for the social contract is different. Uh, instead of it being a uh, winner-takes-all, uh, you know, dog-eat-dog -dog, uh, world, instead it's a loving family as far as Locke is concerned. Uh, but it gets too complex. And so what happens is we have to form rules uh, to regulate how we do things. But the main reason that we do this is not for security, uh, but for ordering our life, liberty, and property. Uh, so we have to, have to have controls over how our property is managed, who gets what, and so on. Um, So his arguments are against an absolute prince, but instead he wants a balance, a balance in government, right? Uh, so that the executive, which would be the prince, uh, is subject to the whim of the parliament or the, the legislative, right? So the legislative creates the laws, says, okay, we're not going to build a wall. The executive says, yes, you will. Right? And then the executive uh, insists on ignoring what the legislative does and, and taking money that the legislative has, uh, body has given to other things and spending it or, or trying to spend it on a wall. Uh, right? That, that's live. That's a, a live issue for us. Uh, that just happened. Right? So it's the same conflict uh, between our current executive and our current uh, legislative body. Right? Uh, so, so that's still as part of a, a, a democracy. Uh, um, checks and balances, right? Now, keep in mind that for Locke, uh, the, uh, I think I might have already mentioned this, that uh, the checks and balances are just between those two branches of government, but the United States famously opted, thanks to our uh, um, so-called founding fathers uh, uh, on three branches of government. So the judiciary is a separate branch, whereas in the British government, it's under the, ex the executive, which is why when the queen marches in, in all her regalia uh, to parliament uh, once or twice a year, uh, she has the judiciary with her in their regal ro robes too, right? Uh, but we, of course, famously have three separate, because our Supreme Court is a separate we fight, of course, over who gets it, but once you get that Supreme Court justice uh, in, uh, they're there for life, basically, yes? Uh, is is just Justice Ginsburg still alive today? Anybody know? Probably not. I saw a, an article saying that she broke three lit ribs, but I think that was the old story. I don't think she's broken three more ribs. Yeah. Hopefully she's back on the bench now reading things and, and so on. She was working from home for a while. But 
I, I thought it was great that you know, all these people all over are offering to give her organs if, if she needs them in order to keep living, even though they would, of course, need their own organs, you know, but it's kind of silly. But that's because she's a liberal judge. Of course, if you're not a liberal, you're not interested in her living, you want her to die as soon as possible so she could be replaced by another pick uh, from the list that the conservatives have evaluated. Okay. So just a short, short piece. To conclude, the power that every individual gave the society when he entered into it. You don't remember that especially, right? Everybody, when you were born, did they have you sign something? Yes, I agree. No, probably not. Uh, never revert to the individuals again as long as the society lasts, but will always remain in the community. Hmm. Keep in mind that not every country in the world has accepted these, these arguments. Uh, they're relatively... Uh, uh, restricted so far to the Western uh, uh, democracies, uh, including the United States and Australia, but didn't go across uh, the world to all other countries. Although, I think I mentioned Francis Fukuyama arguing in his famous book, uh, the end of history, hopefully. The end of history in the last man. Remember, the end of history is the aim of history, not, not the last day that history will occur. So that's a, an inter a misinterpretation of the title that a lot of people uh, took, which resulted in a lot of hilaritude as people thought uh, that Fukuyama's thesis could obviously be disproved by the fact that next year came, which of course was not, not what he was talking about. He was talking about the, the aim of history. And, the, and the, uh, the narrative, by the way, where that comes from is Hegel's philosophy, and his idea is that there is an end goal in the evolution of history. And that end goal, even though it will never actually be reached, is freedom, right? So that the, that, that pol the political economy, if you will, uh, has a natural evolutionary direction. And that direction is in uh, essentially more chaos occurring. Freedom, right? So, so you know, it starts off historically with very restrictive forms of government once, once governments start and it gradually uh, evolves so that more and more individuals in society have some of the freedom uh, and eventually uh, it gets to a democracy where theoretically everyone has freedom, right? Um, and once you get to that point, uh, then that's the end of what history was aiming at. Uh, I'd, I'd like to tie that in clearly to the physics of it, uh, which is the law of thermodynamics again that says everything tends to the cool, right? So that, that everything uh, breaks apart, symmetry breaks, uh, so the, the coherence of the government breaks down and everything starts moving towards chaos, uh, which would be in that sense also the same thing as freedom. Is this interesting or is this boring? I, can tell from your reactions. Okay, so the end of history. And the, the last man comment there as part of the book is what will that last man, uh, you know, including women, uh, be like, you know, when they're at that uh, end of history uh, like that? Um, you, you guys, basically, you know, me, you know, us, you know, in our society, uh, what, what are humans like uh, in this kind of situation? And for Fukuyama, the, the end uh, um, form of government, uh, the end uh, that delivers the most freedom is a democratic republic, which the United States theoretically has, and free market capitalism. 
free market capitalism, right? You know, so, so that, that was his understanding. And by the way, this book was written right after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the wall uh, in Berlin. Uh, and so, so it certainly looked like that had been achieved, uh, supposedly. Uh, although when uh, you listen to Fukuyama, he's of course continued uh, to stay on this task. Uh, and his books have gotten better over the years. Um, have I showed you Fukuyama speaking uh, so far? No, I should show you that. Let me show you him talking. His latest book is on identity. I didn't show you anything on that. That's kind of, so let me just go to his books so you get an idea. So the end of history and the last man. By the way, he was in the Rand Corporation when he wrote that. Uh, and I don't know if you're aware of the Rand Corporation is a conservative think tank uh, that's still there as far as I know. Um, uh, and some of what he, his work uh, did supported the Reagan administration as far as I know. Uh, but trust, the social virtues and the creation of prosperity, in order for us to have prosperity in our form of government, we have to trust one another. I have to be able to go to a car dealer and the car dealer tell me you have this, 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 you know, this car will be warranted for this many years, it has this kind of mileage, etc. I have to be able to trust that person uh, for me to feel comfortable buying a vehicle through them. Uh, I think it, it kind of ruins the trust somewhat when as soon as you agree to buy the car, they sit you down and they start saying, you could also get it rust proofed and you could get plastic coating and you could get uh, extra this and extra that and all that does is add another 30 some dollars a month to your your loan, right? You know, that's that's breaks the trust to some extent because it seems all, almost pretty clear that they're trying to take advantage of you once they've they've got you agreed to buy the car, right? Uh, so so you know you need a certain level of trust in order for the society to cohere, uh, but we're always uh, you know, and, and it seems like physics, it's always breaking at the, the edge, you know, trying to push uh, things, you know, so, so we need to trust one another, but there's always things going on that sort of ruin that trust. Uh, and so, of course, we have to create laws in order to restrict that kind of thing. But if we create too many laws, it becomes a burden, right? So you don't have the kind of society where everyone can trust one another. Instead, it becomes... Uh, you know, overpopulated with restrictions. So that's another balance you have to keep uh, in mind uh, when you're trying to keep uh, a, a society going. Um, so trust, very important. Uh, the Great Disruption. This was, I thought at the time, an absolutely fascinating book uh, because this was when everybody uh, was also talking about Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, uh, which was I think probably uh, more famous uh, than Fukuyama's book, uh, but Bowling Alone basically uh, said, you know, well, the, the generation before mine had been joiners. They belonged to lots of different groups, like the Elks, Seroptimus, uh, Kiwanas, uh, um, Moose, right? You know, the Masons, you know, you know all these different different uh, uh, groups, right, that, that uh, people would join. They had bowling teams, you know, and bowling leagues, local bowling leagues. So you would go with friends and go bowling. You know, so you were bowling together in groups. Uh, but my generation came along and started bowling alone. In fact, we didn't bowl at all, actually. Uh, um, and, and why did that happen? Or, you know, what was this, the cause of this great, great disruption in our society? Uh, several reasons. Uh, we didn't stay at home. We got in our cars and we drove to California or went somewhere else. I, heck, I was just as guilty as that. I joined the Army and the Army sent me to California, uh, then Berlin, then Fort Meade, then here. Here was absolutely the craziest. You imagine my family back east all wondering, Alaska? Right? Everybody knows back east that if you're going to move to Alaska, that means you're going to live in a igloo, 
<laughs> with penguins, <laughs> which don't fly, right? So, you know, that's, um, I love this commercial. Uh, I think it's for an antacid. Maybe I won't be able to find it because I don't even know what it's for. But it's a commercial with igloo and um, he, he's hungry for chicken. Does he find the chicken? Will that find the video? Nope, I'm not going to find it. That's not enough of a search. But if you've ever, ever, ever saw the, the commercial, the husband and wife are sleeping in their igloo. Uh, yes, have you seen this? And, and he wakes up and he's, he's hungry. And so he says, is there any chicken left over? And his wife says, yes, it's in the freezer. And then the next scene shows him walking about 100 meters away from this igloo in the background out in the, in the ice and digging up uh, the chicken. That's just hilarious. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it or not. Um, not going to find it. Oh well. Um, okay, so the great disruption. Why, why were we so disrupted uh, that we weren't uh, coming together? Um, uh, and a lot of it was uh, the media, the new social media. Um, you know why? You know. So my remember my my test question. Some of you answered. You know why? Uh, uh, how has uh, the new media? Uh, uh, social media changed uh, the way our society functions, right? Uh, we're all, I, and this, this happened even just this morning when I was walking over here, I passed a person that walked by me and I said, good morning, and the person didn't even hear me, of course, because he had his earbuds uh, in uh, while he was doing whatever. So he was removed in a sense. We, we weren't, you know, I used to be able to say hi to students and so on, uh, although that gradually changed. As people started talking on phones, uh, it certainly changed things. I, I still remember one summer, you know, the summers here on this campus, it's a beautiful campus, and um, uh, I, I like being here more in the summer than in the rest of the year because it's so beautiful. They have flowers all over the place and everything. Um, uh, but one problem with it is uh, students especially female students, tend to forget to wear clothing. I don't know if you've ever noticed. Any, any of you been here during the summer? You know, women will wear uh, the clothing that's appropriate to maybe the beach in Oahu or something, right? You know, that's you know, totally wrong for, for being a student in a classroom because who the heck can concentrate when you've got basically nude people sitting in the class? Yes, you know, that's just Im impossible. Uh, but I remember the one young lady walked by while I was walking the other way. Uh, and as she walked by, she was talking to some obviously young man on the phone. And as she walked by, I heard her saying, you're such a bad boy. And instantly, my genes kicked in and made me jealous, you know, of the... You know how that, you know, that's not like I wanted to be. You know, it's, I was put in an uncomfortable situation. You know, that's just totally wrong. Um, uh, but she was t oblivious to the fact that I was walking by the other way right while she was walking by saying that to that young man. So, so obviously our uh, uh, society has been disrupted. Is it just the media? Is it transportation technology? Uh, you know, why has this happened? Is it, is it the advance of this modern individual so that we're less and less joiners, we're less and less uh, uh, connected to others? And of course, the serious concern that Fukuyama brings up is that this destroys social order. Social order requires us uh, to believe in similar things. You know, if we, we don't believe in the same, same sorts of things, we can't vote on uh, the problems we have, we can't achieve things, um, and our society will gradually uh, break apart. You know, more, more and more, more chaos. So that's where we've got to, you know, set, you know, 
hold the reins, you know, and basically bring it back. Uh, when we uh, had the uh, terrorist attacks September 11th, uh, 2001, uh, um, that was considered to be a, a, a point where, where we started pulling back on the freedom that people had, say, for example, to travel. Uh, if you went to the airports, uh, you were now uh, checked uh, by the TSA uh, and you know all sorts of things to make sure you weren't uh, uh, carrying weapons or bombs onto the airplanes, right? Everybody complained because now, of course, you have to go through all this stuff. Got to take your shoes off, you know. Plus, you know, after the one bomber uh, had a bomb in his groin, in his underwear, thank goodness it didn't actually explode. It just, well, decapitated him, basically, uh, in a manner of speaking, right? Uh, the uh, uh, it, the, it got crazy, right? And it still is, you know. So, so there's restrictions in order to prevent those kinds of things happening, uh, and yet at the same time, we we had this tipping point. We want to keep fighting back. We want our freedom. Uh, we don't want to have our planes blowing up in the air, uh, etc. Right? You know, we've got to protect things. We've got to protect our our water systems, our electrical systems. Today, of course, the big issue is the security of our, our, our media, our, our, our internet and our, our webs, right? Um, his next book, Fukuyama, Our Post-Human Future, and what, of course, he is worried about here is our ability to genetically enhance human beings, how soon before we become X-Men, you know, and, and you, know, the, you know, designer babies uh, you know, parents going in and saying, we want one of these, you know. Uh, I mean, that was actually the sort of thing that Don and I did when we wanted to adopt. We would go into the agency and, uh, and say we would like to adopt, and they would give us the catalog of pictures and, and various children that are on the list, right, that you could adopt. And we would sit there and page through, and, and we'd pick a few, you know, oh, we, we'd like this one or this one or this one. Uh, by the way, none of those were available for, for one reason or another. Uh, it was a terrible system. Uh, of course, the ones we got were absolutely marvelous. Uh, you know, three out of four of our children are absolutely wonderful, um, etc. cetera. Uh, so our post-human future, consequences of the biotechnology revolution, right? State building, that was his, his book uh, that he wrote uh, uh, while watching what was happening in the Middle East. Uh, if you recall, uh, we had uh, the Persian Gulf crisis, we had uh, the First War, et cetera, right? And uh, part of the goal uh, of uh, the Bush administration and Vice President Cheney was to build democratic states, right? Uh, you know, after all, Fukuyama was the one that said, you know, that the end uh, of history would be a, a, a democratic republic with free market capitalism. So let's make sure Iraq uh, is such a state, right? And so they started to build it uh, from uh, the top down, which by the way, Fukuyama points out in state building, uh, doesn't work that way. In order to build a democratic republic uh, in a, a free market capitalist system, you have to start uh, by educating the youth in a society that raises them that way. Uh, you can't just take someone who's not uh, a believer, a modern, not a modern person, doesn't have that, those programs installed. You can't just turn around and tell that person, okay, now you get to vote, et cetera, right? You no, know, that doesn't work. You know, so state building, uh, was one of, was his book that basically was arguing against what a lot of people were criticizing in the Bush administration, thinking that they could just top down, say, okay, you're a democracy now. Uh, it still hasn't worked, if you're familiar with what's going on. America at the Crossroads, Democracy, Power, and the Neoconservative Legacy. Uh, he was considered originally part of those neoconservatives. Leo Strauss was really the kind of the the philosopher in uh, the head of that in the University of Chicago. Uh, and in fact, he was a student of Leo Strauss, so 
So there's so there's a clear connection with uh, Francis Fukuyama there. Um, falling behind, explaining the development gap between Latin America and the United States. Uh, um, part of this is his pointing out that where the modern societies developed were Protestant nations. Uh, and so if you look at, at the uh, nations that were still predominantly Catholic or uh, religiously conservative, uh, they hadn't allowed that modern person to develop and people could not therefore become industrious and concerned about their own individual success. Uh, they were still basically attached to sheepdom, right? You know, they were still sheeple, basically, and doing what the shepherd uh, told them to do, right? Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, the Origins of Political Order was the first volume of his uh, main work uh, in retrospect when we look at, at it. They're the biggest ones. Uh, and The Political Order and Political Decay is the second volume of that. Um, the Origins of Political Order is a history of the development of all the forms of governments, very, very much like Hegel's uh, Philosophy of History uh, book, except updated with all sorts of ter tremendous uh, um, information. And Political Order and Political Decay picks up from there uh, and basically uh, talks about the worrisome uh, changes that are taking place as we reach a tipping point. But Identity, his latest book, is the one that he wrote uh, immediately after uh, uh, Donald Trump was elected. So maybe I should let him talk for himself a little bit. This video, it's a good, good one, but the sound is awful. Let me just try this one. This one's not as good, but of course we don't have that much time. Either. Democratic societies are, of course, pluralistic, and they have these differences in experience, but if they're going to be democratic communities, they also have to hold something in common. They have to have certain common values in order to discuss, to deliberate, to you know, work together in the context of uh, democratic uh, institutions. And when identity begins to stress you know, difference rather than shared experience, or if you say you've got these different lived experiences with no possibility of a common experience, then I think uh, you've got uh, uh, a certain problem. Uh, there are other you know, manifestations of this, I think, in terms of free speech. This has been discussed a lot. I think this is more a, an issue in certain universities and in the arts community and, and so forth, where uh, there is a view that has grown up that my, the way that I was born determines the way that I'm going to think. Uh, so that, you know, and that can be based on race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, gender orientation, uh, and so forth. And uh, that is a really ironic outcome because, in a sense, the struggle of modern liberalism was to get away from biological characteristics and say, actually, you know, we're all equal human beings, we all have equal agency, <coughs> and we're going to interact, you know, as this kind of uh, universal you know, uh, uh, human agent. Uh, and instead you say, well, no, actually we're all divided into these groups that are determined by, you know, how we're born, our religious traditions, our you know, biological tradition, and that should influence the way that we think about politics, about culture, uh, about a lot of other issues. And so there's something, you know, there's something discordant with uh, a kind of understanding of a liberal tradition, I think, that is involved in this sort of uh, identity uh, politics. Uh, the worst thing, I think, in a sense, is what it's done. So this, this, this understanding of identity that grew up on the left has now triggered uh, a, a corresponding movement on the right, and that's what Donald Trump has uh, So Donald Trump, I think, uh, th this is the part that I think a lot of people don't quite understand. A lot of people voted for Donald Trump who are not, you know, workers in manufacturing, uh, uh, 
plants that lost their jobs in China. A lot of people are much better off uh, than that. Uh, they still supported him, partly, you know, it was just kind of Republican partisanship, but partly I think they were responding to this cultural complaint that the left had become so politically correct that he couldn't talk about, you know, issues uh, honestly, and that's why he surprised everybody by calling Mexican rapists by the Hollywood access page, you know, all of these things that should have sunk a normal politician didn't sink him, and deliberately so, because I think, you know, a lot of his popularity lay in the fact that he was not politically correct, he could challenge, you know, some of these nostrums of the way that, you know, Americans have developed about talking uh, about themselves, and I think that that continues to be one of his uh, enduring sources of popularity. You know, I hate to say this, but I think he's basically a racist, and he's been perfectly happy to um, be racially divisive. He really got his start uh, in politics by uh, suggesting that President Obama was not born in the United States. Uh, he, you know, has been somewhat careful in making overtly racist statements, but I think it's pretty clear that you know, he's perfectly happy to capitalize on the racial feelings that other Americans have towards each other, and that has been very bad. And so you now have an alt-right and a, you know, kind of set of white nationalist groups that have been, I think, pretty much marginalized over the period since the civil rights movement that are now, uh, that are now coming back. So this is not a good situation. You know, this is not a good situation if both the left and the right see themselves in these increasingly biologized uh, identity categories. And you know, my own view is that we need to get back to the 20th century. <laughs> we sort of have to go back to class because actually sociologically class is the single most important dividing line between Americans right now. If you read, uh, you know, there's a couple of different books that build on the same kind of data. One comes from Charles Murray, his book on the white working class. The other one from Bob Putnam uh, at Harvard, you know, on the other side of the political spectrum. They present exactly the same sort of data. That over the last 30 years, if you look at inequality, it is almost entirely class-based. That is to say, if you have uh, a university education or higher, You've done extremely well in this country, and if you have high school education or lower, uh, you've fallen off a cliff, basically, in terms of your income. And then in terms of you know, social status, I mean, 72,000, the latest CDC estimate, 72,000 Americans died the most recent year that they can you know, estimate this for uh, from this opioid uh, epidemic, most of whom are you know, rural, working class, white people. Uh, so the social catastrophe in a certain sense facing, you know, poorly educated Americans, regardless of ethnicity or race or class or gender, uh, is, you know, is, is pretty horrific. And within all of the identity groups, you see the same kind of split, uh, you know, where African Americans that have higher education are doing better, women, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, so I actually think that we've got a really good class problem in the United States. It is one that is probably best addressed uh, through, I think, classic social policy. Uh, I really like Obamacare. I think that that was an example of something that was not identity-based. It was really a policy meant to give health care to all Americans that didn't have it. And, you know, that kind of a focus should really be the focus of uh, the way that we try to reintegrate uh, our society. I think that national identity is important, but it has to be, and this is where Europe, uh, I think, has got, in a certain way, a bigger problem than the United States, because the United States, I think, by the period after the Civil Rights Movement, had actually arrived at what I would call a, a civic identity, meaning that our identity was not based on ethnicity or race. It was based on belief in the Constitution, belief in the rule of law, belief in the principle of human equality embodied in the Declaration uh, of Independence. And so you could be naturalized as an American citizen from Guatemala or Korea or wherever. The moment you put the naturalization oath, you could say, I'm an American, and nobody, you know, would laugh at you uh, for saying it. That's what it means to have a civic uh, sense of national identity. And I thought that that had been an acquired, you know, something that we had really acquired painfully over you know, the 250 years of American history, and now that's really being challenged by certain people on the right that want to drag us backwards into a more ethnic or racial understanding of what it means uh, to be an American.
America, in Europe, you've got, you know, you've got thicker cultures in each individual European country, and therefore the, the task of integrating newcomers has been uh, a lot harder. So that's one issue. You've got to have a national identity that is open, that fits the de facto multicultural society that we live in. So another interesting YouTube video. Your learning experience is important. We get it. At the front, you'll be more than just learning. You'll experience. Sorry about that. Well, good evening. My name is Nairi Woods, and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. It gives me particular pleasure to be moderating a debate on the question Western liberal democracy would be wrong for China. In establishing a school of government, what's struck me is how much that question is being asked both outside in and inside out around the world. How many times in the United States and Europe I've been asked if it wouldn't be better to move to a model of authoritarian or benign dictatorship, and how many times in China and elsewhere I've been asked searching questions about democracy. So this is a truly timely debate. Um, you will be casting your vote at the end of the debate, for those of you who are coming to this as a first and final square debate. Um, you pay your ticket in two, and you can cast your vote either for or against, depending on which of these fantastic panelists has persuaded you that their side of this. So as you can tell, um, one of the um, societies uh, of great interest is China. Um, clearly China is not a democratic republic uh, and they don't have a free market capitalist society. Uh, so if you look at Fukuyama's argument and the basic legitimating narrative of our, our form of government, China is ignoring it. And so the question uh, uh, that Fukuyama really uh, has been arguing all his career uh, is that this is the form of government that is evolving uh, uh, you know, naturally. You know? so, so we go, go forward and back, you know, as Lenin uh, famously wrote, shag period dva shaga nazad, right? One step forward, two steps back. Um, you uh, uh, end up with uh, eventually the right form of government. You might have riots in the street of, of Paris, uh, but we expect it to be resolved uh, so that eventually something is going to, to, to come of it. But China uh, famously uh, throws a, a lug wrench into that whole uh, argument uh, because they don't seem to be moving in that direction. Instead, uh, they do seem to be blending into a different form of government uh, that's kind of a mixture of the, uh, the traditional Chinese form of government. Uh, I think a lot of folks uh, refer to China as essentially uh, a communism. Uh, we can think of Mao Zedong, for example, as a, as a tyrant, uh, or you could look at him as the savior of, of the Chinese uh, against the encroachment of the West uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, was essentially a, a puppet uh, leader uh, using uh, Western technology to try to control China. Uh, and so the, the, art, you know, the fight uh, between uh, Mao Zedong and the communists against Chiang Kai-shek, uh, whose forces ended up in Taiwan, which is why Taiwan is still a separate uh, government, right? Um, uh, you know, as, as part of that whole whole picture. Um, uh, but what kind of government have they actually had? Uh, if you look at China, uh, one of the, uh, I think I've, I've mentioned Henry Kissinger before, and I know a lot of people absolutely hate him because he was Secretary of State during 
the Nixon administration, and of course that means Vietnam. Um, uh, but actually, despite that. Please join me in welcoming Henry Kissinger and Steve Warlands. Let's give them a big hand. But Henry Kissinger, whether you like him or not, is a genius, I would argue. Um, in fact, I think pretty much everyone agrees to that. Um, and if you recall, during the Nixon administration, that was when Nixon went to China. Uh, but before Nixon went to China, Kissinger went to China. Uh, and Kissinger was the, 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 the opening diplomat uh, that uh, started all of that uh, and it was a balancing act part of that the reason for that was uh, by becoming uh, do we call it friends with China that balanced uh, the Soviet Union instead of just the Soviet Union and us China was in between between us and, and we were on China China's side. And remember, China is right underneath a major part of the Soviet Union, what's now Russia. Uh, and so China was a threat, really, uh, to Russia to some extent, right? You know, you know, they can't still be thought of as a threat uh, because there's what, how many billion Chinese? I forget. Two billion, something like that. There's hardly any Russians in Siberia, and you know that's a lot of land just sitting north of the Yalu, not the Yalu River, that's Korea. I forget the name of the river, that's like the, the dividing line there. Uh, but in any case, uh, um, there are Chinese companies and Chinese business people that are in Siberia, that you know they migrated there, so. So what we have is a form of government that Kissinger argues is essentially the same as the Ming Dynasty, the, uh, the Han Dynasty. So you st still basically have an emperor. Uh, you still have uh, the bureaucratic structure that China's had for thousands of years. Um, and by the way, Fukuyama talks about that when he talks about um, uh, the origins of uh, um, uh, um, political uh, uh, st structure. Uh, he talks about China's form of government, and essentially it's still pretty much the same as it was. But now they've adopted, as a totalitarian state, adopted uh, capitalist market, uh, free market, uh, um, approaches to things, but it's top-down ordered by the state. Uh, so for example, uh, 60 Minutes had an interesting uh, presentation a couple weeks ago about uh, the Chinese decision to build electric cars. So they didn't have them before, uh, but they're, they've set the goal of millions of electric cars within just a couple of years. And in fact, their, their electric cars are doing so well, they're competing against Tesla. If you're familiar with Tesla, the, the uh, uh, folks in the stock market are worried that Tesla is basically going to be trounced by these Chinese uh, electric vehicles uh, that are being basically mass produced uh, in China compared to uh, the, the Tesla plant. Uh, so, so this is the new form of government that is v viewed as in competition with the free market capitalist system, which seems to be stuck. I mean, we're obviously still uh, um, uh, growing at roughly 3% a year. Remember Thomas Piketty talking about that? Um, but at the same time, uh, we've got uh, China uh, advancing at 6 to 6.5%. That's their target. Uh, in, in uh, growth. Um, by the way, that's still, when, when you look at the actual numbers and you see how many wealthy people there are in China and you compare that per capita to the United States, the United States is still tremendously more powerful economically uh, than China. 
Uh, so, so one of the things that Kissinger uh, argues is that we don't have to really worry about China taking over the world anytime soon, but of course it is very important. Uh, so, um, meanwhile, we also have our narrative has changed somewhat, and part of it, of course, is because Hobbes and Locke and another one, Rousseau, uh, whose, whose social contract, by the way, I would argue is absolutely horrible. Have I mentioned Rousseau at all? Have we talked about him? Um, Rousseau got his start as an opera composer. Have I talked about Rousseau yet? Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Yes? Nobody? Yes? No? Okay, so Rousseau uh, wrote an opera, wrote operas. I don't know if he wrote more than one. It wasn't too bad. It was actually fairly popular. But he wrote to his friend, or talked to his friend, Voltaire, yes, and asked, how do I become popular? How do I become famous? And Voltaire said, easy, all you have to do is write books that say just the opposite of what everybody believes is true. So Rousseau decided to try this out, and he wrote a book about education, for example. What's the best education, Emile, uh, is the book, right? Uh, and by the way, we still use that in the School of Education and Philosophy of Education. I don't know if you've, you've read it or not. Uh, but his argument was the best form of education is no education, because education just bores people and corrupts us. Uh, basically, a child uh, will do better if you just let the child live and grow up, and if it survives, and comes to you and asks questions, then you can answer the questions. So the education of a child should be child-centered. Let the child ask the questions, right? Um, uh, believe it or not, we still uh, use that um, in our College of Education, as far as I know. Um, uh, but it's actually, I think, a joke uh, that Rousseau played on everyone, and they took him seriously, and in fact, he became famous. Same thing with government. What's the best form of government? The best form of government is no government. Because <laughs> government corrupts us. Society corrupts us. We're absolutely wonderful people all by ourselves in the woods. Totally the opposite of Hobbes, right? Instead of, instead of a dog-eat-dog -dog world where everybody's trying to kill one another and take whatever. If you look at us in a state of nature, we're just the ideal human beings. It's like the Eden, you know, uh, idea. You know, the 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 last of the Mohicans. The you know the the great native, you know, kind of uh, image. You know, where we're just in the woods. We're in our natural element, and we're not corrupt, and we're not sinful. We're so virtuous and everything. But as soon as we form a society, that's when corruption uh, starts. Um, uh, it's totally ludicrous uh, to argue this way. Uh, and yet his version of the social contract, called the social contract, actually uh, was used by France when they had their revolution, and it famously became the terror, <laughs> as uh, uh, um, Edmund Burke uh, argued, uh, talking about what was going on in France during the revolution. He argued, it's going to collapse, it's going to turn into absolute chaos, uh, everybody's going to be killing one another, uh, and eventually one of the generals is going to take over. Uh, and by the way, he thought Lafayette would be the, that general. He didn't expect Napoleon, but and Burke was dead before Napoleon actually uh, did do that. But so a lot of Burke's predictions occurred. Uh, um, uh, where that was why I think I mentioned Burke uh, in talking about. Um, Mary Wollstonecraft, because remember she wrote against Burke uh, at the time. So you have um, other versions of the social contract. Uh, uh, Rousseau uh, basically gives us the, the worst version of that, uh, um, where everyone has to vote yes or you don't do it. Uh, so total chaos reigns. Um, uh, but today, we still have the social contract, 
as our legitimating narrative. But we can't use Hobbes and Locke as the basis uh, for how we change our laws. Um, so who do we have? We have John Rawls. So if you go to law school and you go to graduate school, you'll have, at least at the University of Chicago, two separate graduate courses on John Rawls's philosophy, political philosophy, one and two. And uh, as you can see, he died 2002. Um, his heir apparent, uh, by the way, would be um, Amartya Sen. who is now the political philosopher at Harvard and has lots of interesting books out. And both John Rawls and Amartya Sen are liberal. And have, uh, so, so um, John Rawls, famous argument uh, which uh, you discuss in law school is um, how do we, uh, view the state of nature today. Uh, so instead of looking at the state of nature in an imaginary way uh, that uh, Hobbes gave us or uh, Locke gave us or uh, Rousseau gave us, instead, um, and, there, and there were others, of course, uh, but when we look at, at, at the, those, uh, um, uh, you know, we might look at Malthus, Thomas Malthus too, uh, uh, but when we look at Rawls, Rawls says, okay, so the state of nature is the current status quo. That's the only uh, way we can look at it, the current status quo. Uh, who's in power now? How, you know, how do our laws actually work? And what a liberal uh, has to do in order to figure out new laws, decide new laws, is to ask the question, how will this affect those among us who have the least? His argument is that all laws have to be made to benefit those of us who have the least. And in order for you to figure out what those things might, must be, he argues that you should put on the veil of ignorance. And what the veil of ignorance does is it enables you to look at the situation, the status quo, without focusing on your own position in it. So you can't, you can't think about what would be best for you. Instead, what you have to ask is what would be best for society? You know, what, what laws would I want uh, uh, so that our government would take care of those individuals that had I not been fortunate enough to, to live the way I did, uh, would uh, be the way I, I would be if I were in their position, right? You know, so how, how do we do that? Uh, so you have the, instead of the state of nature, he calls it the original position, and what the individual legislator has to do is use that veil of ignorance to think not for their own best interest, but instead for the best interest of everyone. Um, so lots of arguments for you know, justice as fairness uh, is the, the, um, the argument there. Um, of course, there's lots of, and Amartya Sen is still moving in that same direction. Although the main difference is Amartya Sen is concerned about worldwide, whereas um, uh, John Rawls, towards the end of his life, did start moving more towards uh, the world. Um, uh, especially through the UN. Uh, so as we, we look at his, his last couple of books, uh, there are lots of, um, so the law of peoples. Uh, so here we're looking at 
uh, um, kind of a worldwide uh, narrative. How do we help everyone? Um, uh, and uh, and Amartya Sen, of course, is in the same boat. Um, so I guess I'm getting close to the end uh, for today, and I need a good. Um, did when we were talking about Hobbes, did I play the the song uh, from 1776? No, let me play that. And my quiz question will be, what kind of bird do you think would best represent? These are people who make Jack Jack culture refined. Yes, kid. They're the same folks who make I think I'll let this one play. So what bird do you think would best represent the United States? It's a masterpiece, I say. They will cheer every word, every letter. I wish I felt that way. That's Adams, Jefferson, and Franklin. This wasn't the way they really were. This is a musical. The new musical today, I believe, is Hamilton, right? Anybody see it? Oh, any questions? Was this fun, or did I bore you to death? Gosh. On this human Monday morning, 